Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast. Today I'm going to do part two that I promised last episode on the pregnancy q and I got so many questions and I didn't get to answer all of them. So I'm going to dive into those and answer the rest of your questions. My name is Lisa, mom of six and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Okay, we'll just dive right into a labor question. Best labor positions slash how to handle hard labor. So far, I wouldn't say that I've had extremely hard labor. I mean, I've had labor and transition and all of that stuff, obviously. So there are parts of it that are really hard, but I've noticed that mine never seemed to last that long, like the part that's extremely, extremely hard. So I don't get checked, but like probably nine centimeters through having the baby, that portion never lasts very long. For me, I just do whatever is comfortable. So with one of my kids, I actually wanted to be on my back, which you read in all the birth books is a terrible idea. I even, whenever I did it, asked my midwife, like, is this bad to be on my back? And she said, you just do whatever is comfortable for you. So I just laid on my back. And with my last child, I believe I was on my side. I did the mile circuit while I was actually in labor in order to get him in the right position. Now that was probably, as far as like pain goes, the most pain I've experienced during labor because I had to be, if you've looked into the mile circuit, there's three phases of it. And the last phase you are laying with your butt up in the air and your chest down on the bed, like a very dramatic type of pose. And so you're in a very awkward position and I was going through transition during that. So I wouldn't say that was my favorite position, but for me, it's just whatever is comfortable. And most of the time that is the position outlined in the Bradley method book. And then during pushing, it's just whatever works. So it depends on also how the baby's positioned and how, if you need to work to get the baby out versus the baby coming out easily, or if you need to get in a certain position in order to make the baby come to the right spot that you would want to just go with your midwives uh, recommendation there. Would you still have wanted to continue having children if you had them via C-section? I assume so. I know that you can only have so many C-sections in a row. So I don't know to an extent, like if you've had six C-sections or something that'd probably limit things. But if you had, you know, a couple C-sections, I don't think that would really make too big of a difference, honestly. I mean, I would probably always attempt to VBAC to a certain extent. Now I know after you've had a certain number of C-sections, you can't do that. So that's not just, that's just not something that I have enough experience with to really comment on. Advice for a first time mom planning an unmedicated birth. My biggest advice is to do what you just said and that is plan. See with my first and with most people I talk to first, I went in very uneducated. I just assumed that the baby would just come out and you know everybody's done this before and I didn't educate myself, research, and figure out the process of labor, what to expect. So whenever things get to a certain level, understanding what's happening to my body and not feeling like I'm actually dying, but what is happening is normal and necessary really helps because what you what happens during labor and the whole process, if you don't know it, and probably back in the day, you know, before epidurals, this was probably something people talked about more. So people didn't go to birth classes and read birth books, but they still had some level of preparation and understanding. I'm sure they probably talked to their parents and they talked to other women and understood what exactly was going to happen to them so that it wasn't something that completely caught them off guard. Whereas in today's culture, unless you seek this information out, which it's very possible to seek out, there are so many people speaking about these things, so it's easy to find. But if you're not looking for it in the right places, you'll just go through all the normal motions, the cascade of interventions, 
it most almost certainly will happen. It is unlikely that, and this does happen, so I'm sure if you're that rare person it's happened to, you're like, yes it does, this, that's how it works. Most likely, if you go in completely unprepared, uneducated about the process, uneducated about the types of interventions that they, they'll they use and their purposes and maybe any side effects or drawbacks, if you don't go into it with that kind of knowledge, one, it'll feel like what's happening to you is not normal. So for example, most of my labors have gone pretty seamlessly. I talked more about my first birth in my first video, so you can check the last Simple Farmhouse Life podcast episode 96, I believe, to hear more about that. What happened with her was definitely with all of the interventions, things went south because of that. And she also had a knot in her cord, but I also had a home birth with a knot in the cord. And so it wasn't just that. But like all of them did come out with just three pushes, I mean, very easily. But when I was at my sister's first more challenging birth, so she's had two births that were what I would consider more challenging. It took beyond two hours on each of them to push them out. And if you're in that situation and you haven't read about people having this happen to them, you likely think that your situation is abnormal and that what you're going through is a really bad situation and it's life or death. And of course, there are those too, which is also good to know because C-sections are a miraculous invention that are life-saving in a small number of cases. But if you go in knowing that it is in the realm of normal to be in the first stage of labor for days, or it is normal or in the realm of normal to push for hours, and you understand, like the Bradley book talks about, the signposts of labor and the whole process of it, you won't think that what you're going through is a, I don't wanna say unique, because it's a very unique situation, but is something outside of normal. And vice versa, you might understand because of your research that what you're going through is in the realm of, of not normal. So if something happens, like a complication, you might also be able to recognize that because of your education. So with my first, I didn't know any of that. And so when I had my water broken by the doctors and I was given Pitocin and the epidural and then her heart rate was dropping, I thought my child is going to die and I thought I was probably the first person to be in labor at the hospital and this stuff happened to them. Turns out later, that's totally not the case. Just about every person I talk to has some kind of similar, dramatic, scary story. And so preparation, understanding the process of labor and what you will feel and understanding that what you feel, like if you feel like these contractions are overpowering your body at some point and really getting just information from other moms and books about what that feels like, you'll know that this is why this is happening. It's all good. I'm okay. I'm not dying because there are times in labor with especially, you know, some labors are harder than others where that might be what you feel, but you know mentally that that's not the case. So being prepared is just it. Research, um, practice. I really like the Bradley Method. I recommend the Bradley Method book by Susan McCutcheon, Natural Childbirth the Bradley Way. That's just what I've used. I've heard people say you should definitely recommend the classes. Possibly so. Um, I didn't personally take them and still felt very prepared. So it's just to the level that you want to feel prepared. Um, Ina Mae Gaskin's book was good. I read that at one time. Oh man, I read more books like back in the beginning of this whole journey. But now on my seventh kid, I just, these are things that are just, I just know them. And so I don't really feel the need to listen to birth podcasts and listen to birth stories, but definitely get yourself in that world for a bit. Do you tandem nurse seeing that your children are fairly close in age? I never was able to keep up my milk supply, but I will say that my kids aren't that close in age. 
at minimum two years, maximum two and a half. So I never, I never had any that were still fully relying on me whenever I was pregnant. And so at some point in pregnancy, my milk supply just completely diminishes and I have a little bit of a break before I have the next baby. Wouldn't be against it. I kind of always plan to do it, but just every time it happens the exact same way where I just simply cannot keep up my supply enough to do that. Having children after 30. So let's see here. I've had four kids in my 20s and two kids, almost three, in my 30s. And I honestly don't feel any different or worse. Now that might increase if I have, if I choose to have any more in my late 30s, but right now physically it feels the same. If anything, I've learned a few things to actually make me understand how to feel more comfortable. So I've talked a lot about taking my magnesium, taking iron. So I know how to keep my iron up. I know that I tend to lack magnesium. In my last pregnancy, I learned to take vitamin D as well. I forgot to mention that. And I don't always remember to take it, but I do sometimes keep that up. My last midwife recommended to supplement with vitamin D because she said that even when you're out in the sunshine, she's never seen someone in, I guess, in our area. So in certain climates of the world, I think you can get enough vitamin D just from natural, just from sunlight. But she's never seen someone test with a good level that doesn't supplement. So I've learned how to keep all of those levels up. I've learned that healthy fats and protein are good to keep you full and to not make you crash. And so I don't do like a ton of carbs. I don't really pay much attention to it, but I do find that during pregnancy, I actually want like carby things a little bit less. And so all of these things, I feel like I've actually, things have gotten a little bit better than they were in my 20s. Like with my first, I didn't know what I was doing at all. I remember even in the beginning because I felt sick, drinking Slim Fast because it was something liquid. And this is when I was 23 years old, or I guess I was 22 most of my pregnancy. And so I've just learned so much since then. I've learned that drinking tons of raw milk just adds protein and fat and staying active. I don't really do anything a whole lot differently than I do in my normal life. And so, um, so far, so good. I'm sure that could, I mean, I'm sure obviously age has some effect on our body and at some point fertility will just completely stop anyways. But so far they have been great. Okay, do your babies ever have rough nights of sleep like they are up for multiple hours? I definitely know that they have. I mostly just like block out things like that, but they definitely, you know, the normal babies have had that. I do feel like co-sleeping, which is so controversial. I got comments in my last one, which I always get comments from people that when I read what they say, I know that they're just saying what they think and they haven't really done a whole lot of research on it because there are certain things that aren't evidence-based. So I like to look at things and look at statistically their outcomes and make decisions based on that, not necessarily just what I think would be the case or fear-based, things like that. And so I am comfortable with co-sleeping. Whether or not you are, totally fine. We, there's so many ways to raise a baby and how they sleep really only affects you and how tired you are, not necessarily the child. But for like at least the first six months, co-sleeping goes so well that I don't really deal with a whole lot of sleep loss. It's usually when I'm transitioning them into their bed, they're learning and they have to, you know, learn how to sleep through the night. And a lot of times they don't. And so I'll end up getting up and nursing them overnight till they're one. And then they go through that phase where they sleep all night, but then they wake up at like 4.30 in the morning. So yes, I've experienced all of those stages. And the thing that helps with having so many kids is the perspective that it really, it really helps you to know how short seasons and phases are. And you know that it's just not gonna be that big of a deal and you're gonna be over it soon. And so it's not something that causes you a whole lot of stress on top of the actual sleep loss. There's this level of stress of, I'm never gonna get this child to sleep through the night that just isn't there because I've just 
seen all of these phases happen six times and six times I have kids who sleep all the way through the night into a decent hour, 5.30 to six, so some of them, but still decent and it always passes. Despite my efforts, despite my best attempts at any kind of training them, it just does happen. And so I isn't something that I get overly worried about. Okay, I don't remember if I answered this one in my last one or not, but how to not be fearful of birth, um, how to not be anxious about the baby or about birth. So birth is something it's unknown. Before it happens, you don't know how it's all going to unfold. Even if you've had five or six really great births, things can definitely be different um, no matter what. And so there are those unknowns. I feel like for me, just this is a completely practical answer, I hardly, even while I'm pregnant, even think about it, mostly because I'm just so busy with other things, um, just raising the other kids, homeschooling, cooking, all of that. And so it isn't something that I give a whole lot of thought to, but if you find that it's something that's consuming your mind, and there have been other pregnancies for me where that has been the case, where I've thought about it, I would seek out positive birth stories. You can find those on YouTube. I've shared a few myself. My sister shared a few. You can find books on childbirth without fear. I believe that was one that I read back in the beginning. Yes, childbirth without fear. Any books that encourage natural, normal birth, because most likely that is what is going to happen. Yes, you can worry and you can have fear about all the possible outcomes, but the most likely scenario is that you will have a normal birth. And so you can prepare and you, you know, understand like what all could happen and have a good childbirth team, whether that's a midwife or an OBGYN to worry about those types of things like safety and be prepared and also know that it's possible and quite likely to have a really great birth. So filling your mind with those kind of things. Also scripture. So be anxious for nothing. Um, Philippians 4, 6. I'm gonna look that up, double check. Yes, okay. So Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You can look up, like just Google, um, and verses for anxiety, for worry, fill your head with those, memorize them. They could also come in handy during labor. You can think about those, think about how the Lord will sustain you through it. Educate yourself on it being a normal process. So when you get hurt, you get in a car accident and you get your legs broken and terrible things happen, that is not, pain that's productive. That's pain that you have to fix and heal. Whereas birth, it it is productive and it's necessary. It's bringing new life into the world and it's supposed to happen. And so knowing all of that really does help mentally to prepare you for it. Okay, this is not necessarily pregnancy and birth related, but just mom related. Differences between young mom, you, and older mom, you. So, oh man, I was just thinking about an example of this today. Oh, I know what it was. It was it was last night. My kids put on some classical music and were dancing around. And we got on the discussion uh, also this morning of when I taught my oldest daughter to read. And it's embarrassing now because I taught her to read when she was three. And that is not something I recommend now at all. But I was so stressed about, and, and not that that's a negative thing. It's not negative to be able to read at three. It's just that the amount of stress and worry I put on raising her from day one, like, oh, I need to have classical music on for her. I need to teach her to read. And not really seeing just how many years I would have with her and how much she would change over those years. All of that perspective just takes away so many of the worries and fears that you have as a new mom that make it incredibly challenging. And I really don't know if it's possible to tell you this 
and then you have that perspective or if you just have to live through it, I'm honestly not sure. But I know like any other moms of older kids or more kids can all attest with me, we've had these discussions, that there are things that you worry about with your firstborn that you just can't even, are laughable later. Like how did I literally spend time stressing and worrying about that? All I had to do was just play with her and take care of her, that was it. I didn't need to have any stress whatsoever. And so I managed to somehow do that anyway. And it, it just made so many things hard. It made it hard from day one. It made it hard with sleep. It made it hard with feeding. Actually, nursing always went pretty well for us. But like, I stressed so much about sleep and where she slept and her schedule and not realizing, like I told you earlier, that they all sleep through the night pretty much regardless of what you do. Because people are always like, well, how do you end up getting them to sleep in their crib? And I'm like, at some point, you just do. You lay them in their crib, they cry a little bit, but it's not very long. Kids learn really easily. Even if you aren't successful with that until they're a little bit older, they still just all do. And, and that's the same, like my sister has five, I have six. We can tell you that with all of them, they all end up learning to read. Obviously, if you have some kind of um, learning disability, that might not be the case, but in general, they learn to sleep, they learn to read, they learn to ride their bike, learn to swim, and it doesn't take a whole lot of stress and worry on your part. I mean, it's obviously important to teach them those things, but I think we forget just how much time. I don't know if I felt like when my child was three, like she was 15, I don't, it's just so funny because my three-year-old now, he's a baby to me. But I remember when she was three, she was a kid. I literally went to homeschool conferences when she was three years old, which is hilarious now. I thought I was like really homeschooling this big kid um, and I didn't need to do anything. And so I feel like stress just consumed so much of my time and my life that that's the biggest difference between younger mom me and older mom me. The things that I think and worry about. Any foods you avoid while pregnant? Um, just alcohol. I mean, obviously that's not a food, but um, I wouldn't drink a glass of wine. That's even up for debate whether that's actually even totally fine. Um, I just personally don't, but that's it. Uh, I eat pretty much everything else. I can't think of anything I avoid because of pregnancy. Okay, how did you deal with others thinking having a home, home birth was crazy and unsafe? Um, I thankfully didn't really have much pushback in my real life. I mean, on the internet, there's always people, no matter what you choose, who are going to tell you that what you're doing is not good, no matter, literally no matter what. I bet you if I told you I was having uh, just, you know, scheduled C-section, or if I was having a regular hospital birth, I don't know, no matter what, I promise you, I would be getting criticism, and that's probably the case for all of you. I do know that there is a bit of a stigma with home birth, but it actually is dissolving. I feel like over time, uh, more and more people are choosing it, and so it is less weird now than it probably was 20 years ago but still there will be people in your life and i think the only thing that you can really do is just know the information for yourself and you're probably not going to be able to convince them most likely if someone is just saying like a lot of times i find this on my videos at least that people will say the first thing that pops in their head it's kind of like the co-sleeping thing it's like the ultrasound thing uh, which is all stuff that I swore I wouldn't get into in detail because it's something that I have read a lot into and I know the people that responded that by their response, like what the argument that they actually gave, and this happens with homeschool too, I can tell that they've looked into it very minimally. There's The responses were stuff that, things that were so obvious and surface level. That is the first thing you would think of when you thought of home birth, and that's the argument you're giving me. So clearly you haven't, a lot of times you will find that they haven't looked much into it beyond 
just their thoughts about it. They haven't looked into statistics, like evidence-based things that show whether or not just statistically it's a safe choice. And so just know yourself, the information, be comfortable, comfortable with it yourself, which I talked a lot about this in my last video. So if it's not something you're comfortable with and you're feeling insecure about the decision, maybe it's not the best decision just on a personal comfortable level. But if you've researched it and you know, a lot of times those people in your life, there's not really a whole lot you can do to say to convince them. So this is just something I have to do a lot with my videos is know when it's a genuine question and somebody's genuinely curious or if nothing I can say is going to change their mind, in which case I'm not gonna engage in that. Did, did you ever have an epidural and or back labor? So I've had one epidural, I've had five non-epidural births and I always have back labor. Um, my first two were born face up, which is what is supposed to explain back labor, but all my other ones were born face down and I still had the same back labor. So I'm really not sure how that all ties in. Honestly, I don't even know what labor feels like except for in your back. That's the only, I mean, I guess I do feel it. It comes around the front. So that's just what is normal for me. Okay, does your insurance cover home birth? So this time around and with Daniel, we did Samaritan's medical sharing and they cover home birth in full. The insurance I had before with Luke's job when he worked with Micah and Eli and Jude, they also covered home birth or birth center birth actually. So yeah, in our area it does. I think it's getting more and more common. I know with my first two, that wasn't the case. And so it was going to be a lot more expensive to have a home birth but things have changed. So I'm not really sure how it is in your state. It might not be that way, but here in Missouri, it is covered just like a normal birth. How to deal with a mother-in-law who is against home birth? Well, this is you and your husband's decision ultimately. So you don't really owe her an explanation. I'm sure it's pretty annoying to hear her criticism, especially because she likely just has these preconceived ideas about it and not necessarily, and maybe she has some really, I mean, there are pros and cons of home and hospital for sure. So there are some legitimate fears for either one. And maybe she has someone she knows whose child died during a home birth or something like that. And that's, there is a certain infant mortality rate across the board, hospitals and home. And I do feel like whenever it's at the hospital, people just, you know, more just say that that was really sad. Whereas if it's at home, it's more the mother's fault. Whereas it can happen either place and it does happen either place. So maybe she has fear in that regard. But if you've looked at, personally for me, I just look at the numbers. Research, mortality rates, infant mortality rates, no, not fun things to think about, but that's what ultimately, I haven't done this research in forever because I did it back when I had my first one with a midwife and I haven't really, you know, I've been so convinced of it just with all the research I did with the first couple of home births that it wasn't something I've had to revisit. But visit all of that and if you and your husband are comfortable, it doesn't really matter if, if she is or not. Okay, would you ever consider a free birth? So from, I don't, I think from my understanding, what a free birth is, is whenever you just do all of the prenatal care and the birth yourself. And I could see this working for certain people. I actually have a friend who is doing this and she is the type of person who really educates herself, which there are good things about it because she is taking so much ownership of this that she you know knows how to what the signs are for certain complications she knows how to check the baby's heartbeat she knows how to do her blood pressure all of the things that could help her to know if there's a potential problem she has taken ownership of which i think is very admirable and i think we could all do that whether we have a provider or not there are certain things that I don't know how to do. And it, it would be smart to learn them regardless because because there's a chance you could have 
uh, unassisted birth on accident, which I did have with one of my kids. And so it really makes sense to be prepared. Now, personally, I don't see any harm in a provider being there. I don't really see the cons of having a midwife. So to me, it's all of the benefits, the educating myself, taking ownership of it, but with none of the cons, still having someone there who has seen hundreds and hundreds of births, who can identify potential signs for things going wrong and just another set of eyes to look at all that. So personally, it's not a decision that I would make, but I also could see how it could possibly work for some people. What is your favorite part of pregnancy? Definitely the movement. So I'm in that stage now where you just sit down and you feel the baby kick and roll around and move. Probably 21 weeks through, I don't know, 40 is my favorite, honestly. Don't like the beginning at all. Okay, I just had my seventh baby without TMI and only if you're comfortable, how is recovery? So I take it really easy. I lay in bed for a good week and then mostly lay in bed for the second week. And that is when I'm doing most of the hard part of recovery. I've never, except for with my first two kids that were born in the hospital, I've never torn. That all is fine. I have really bad afterbirth pains. I don't know if they're unusually bad or if it's just the normal amount of bad but it feels like continuing labor. And then I almost always have some pretty severe breastfeeding soreness. So my last two did have tongue ties and we had to have them reversed, which you know helped, but it still was like a week of just like horrible nursing pain. So recovery is fine, but I will say that it is definitely hard. So if it's hard for you, Again, I think that is in the realm of normal. It always gets better. After a week or two, I'm feeling pretty much normal, not at my full activity level, but getting there, it's really short phase. And I actually really enjoy it because I do just stay in bed. Luke helps with the kids and we just, I just lay there with a precious newborn. And so that does, even out to being really great, even if there is p definitely pain associated with it, I'm not gonna lie. There is a lot of pain for me in my first week, but I would say by week two, I'm feeling pretty darn good again. What has been your worst pregnancy symptom with all your pregnancies? Definitely um, the just morning sickness, and it's not even that bad, but for the first 14 weeks, you know, four or five to 14 weeks, just feeling really tired and nauseated is by far the worst thing. I can deal with varicose veins. I can deal with feeling a little bit tired and like I need to sit down more throughout the day. That's all good. If that sickness didn't end, which I know for some women it doesn't, I don't even know how you guys deal because that is the worst part for sure. How do you manage all of your kids' schedules while also being pregnant? So what we do is we keep our schedules very minimal. We don't have a lot of outside activities. The girls are both in gymnastics. They're in the same class, so it's once a week. And so that's pretty darn easy. And then other than that, we still homeschool all through the summer. But again, I get asked this all the time. How do you do it all? And I, I know it, I've said it so many times, but it does bear repeating that I have lots of help. So I have hired people for my business that regularly help me every single week with posting and video editing. I have Luke home full time. So we divide like in the morning, he takes the older three and homeschools them. I'm just a stay at home mom with the younger three for the first couple hours of the day. Then we have certain times throughout the day where we do work, but it's just, it's, I don't have a crazy schedule. I don't know how I would keep up with it if I did. So we just try to keep schedules as minimal as possible. This is not super pregnancy related, but I guess in the way it is, where will you focus your time in business? What's the most lucrative and best use of time? It is pregnancy and birth related because I do keep things pretty minimal while pregnant and while probably about the first six months. And so the way that I will be able to keep up with my business during Pregnancy, which pregnancy doesn't really slow me down a whole lot, to be completely honest. I mean, the first trimester totally does. The rest of it, not so much. 
Um, a new baby, yeah, it does a little bit. And so as far as prioritizing my time for my business, I'll stick with my two blog posts, my two videos, and then um, my course. And that's probably about it for a while. Now I'd like to launch new products. I'd like to launch a cookbook. I have so many ideas, but I just know now is not the time. That's how it feels whenever I go to think about working on those things. It just never feels like right now is the right time for that. And so yeah, I'm keeping it pretty minimal. The best use of my time currently for how I have my business structured is getting out two blog posts and two videos per week. That seems to make the wheels all turn just in the way that they need to. Now I also do this podcast, but it is not my first priority, which you've probably noticed because I try to post every Thursday. I skipped last Thursday because we went and visited my friend Sarah Jo from Briarton Farm. And I would never, I mean, I wouldn't say never, but for the most part, for the last five years, I don't miss my schedule for the blog and the YouTube channel pretty much ever. But this podcast is the first thing to go if anything else is going on. It's pretty easy for me to talk myself out of it because I can get by with just the other things. And so if you don't see me on here sometimes, that is why, same with Instagram. I show up on Instagram when I feel like it and when I can, not as faithfully as those other components of my business. Okay, a couple of the same question-ish on whether I instinctively knew that I was pregnant before the signs or what were the signs before the positive pregnancy test. So let me just say that I am not one of those intuitive people. You know the people that say that they know what gender they're having, I literally guessed five of my six wrong. Um, I never know that I'm pregnant until the obvious sign of knowing I'm pregnant ever. Uh, I don't have any signs, I don't have any feelings. If I do, they're usually wrong because there's definitely been months where I swear that I'm pregnant and then I'm not. So I guess all of that to say is I am just not one of those intuitive people, I guess. I don't really know if, I don't know, I guess God could give someone the knowledge of that and maybe I'm just not as in, t in tune to that, but I do question when people say that they always knew the gender, how many times that worked. Did it, did it work twice? Did it work three times? Because I knew the gender and if I'd been right, then I would still be saying it, but I'm always so wrong that I know that's not the case and so, I mean, I'm just saying maybe you got lucky <laughs> or maybe you got lucky twice. But I mean, if you really did guess like six times in a row, then maybe there truly is just something to it. Um, and so I'm not ruling that completely out, but I have to say that I currently have my doubts. All right, well, thank you so much for watching slash listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Join me in my next one. I'm going to be talking about back when Luke worked for the city and we lived on one income with five kids and how that went. Now we still currently live on one income, it's the blogging income, but that was more of like a fixed income. And so that was the, that is what I have planned for my next time. I realize that my podcast episodes are very sporadic. They're always based on questions I'm getting, suggestions from you guys. Part of me wants to move to the type of uh, podcast schedule that I've seen a lot of really great podcasters do, where they have a theme for the season and then they make videos or podcasts surrounding that. So I would really like to do that. And if I can ever pull it all together and I'm not recording this basically on the day that I'm trying to post it, then I will at the moment, like I mentioned, this is my third priority. It is very far down the list. I do enjoy doing it. And I feel like a lot of you like this casual style for me, but most of my energy in preparation and thought does go to my YouTube channel and my blog. So if you have not yet checked those out, you can find them at youtube.com slash farmhouse on Boone, uh, just farmhouse on Boone on YouTube. Those are planned out so far in advance. Same with my blog. I have whole 
board where I schedule out two blog posts and two vlogs or YouTube videos every single week. I have it written out through August right now. Well, not through August, but like a few weeks into August. So those are planned and this podcast is more casual and sporadic. So maybe someday I'll pull it all together and it won't be such a haphazard, just share what I share when I share it type of thing. Uh, and you'll know what to expect. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening and I'll see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast. <music>